Hi everyone. Uh, in this video I want to talk about genomic imprinting, which is this really surprising and cool phenomenon uh, that's observed in some genes. Um, and on the way to that we're going to talk about epigenetics and introduce the concept of methylation. Alright, so let's start with the concept of methylation. Um, so what we're here, we're, we're looking at now, um, on the left this is a normal sort of standard cytosine base, and on the right what we see is that it's a cytosine base, but it has this methyl added to it. Okay, so this doesn't change it from a, a cytosine into another base. It doesn't change it from cytosine to uracil, cytosine to thymine. Um, what it does is it adds a little mark. And this mark is re recognizable by the cellular machinery. Um, so basically what this is is a cytosine that has a little bit of bookkeeping mark that can be read out. And, and note that this is reversible, so this, uh, the methylations are added by DNA methyl transferases, but they can also be removed on mechanisms that are, that are more poorly understood. Okay, so if we think about that in its context, so in fact, it's not just a cytosine that gets methylated, it's always a cytosine followed by a guanine, a 5' prime cytosine guanine dinucleotide that gets the methylation mark added to it. We can just use this little Burger King crown here to indicate methylation. Well, if we think about what's happening on the other strand, actually on the other strand, the pair with the CG is another five prime CG three prime. And so not surprisingly then, when methyl groups are added, they actually get added to both of the cytosines symmetrically. And so if we think about that in context, so here's a longer uh, piece of double-stranded DNA, um, we see that um, this single cytosine gets added, but often actually uh, a bunch of nearby CG dinucleotides will all kind of get methylated together. And so that often what we look at is a pattern within the DNA of a region with a few methylated uh, CG nucleotides. Okay, and so why do we care about imprinting, or sorry, why do we care about methylation? So we're going to talk about imprinting in a moment, but for now we're just talking about methylation. So it often affects transcription, um, and in fact it often silences transcription of neighboring genes. So what that would mean is, here we've got a gene um, that is, uh, that has these CG nucleotides that are not methylated, that will tend it to uh, transcribe, Whereas down here we have the same sequence with methylation that will tend to silence transcription. Um, and so now we can talk about imprinting. So the phenomenon of imprinting is this one where if we were looking at two alleles of the same gene in an individual, in a diploid like you or me, um, we'll see a pattern where either uh, the gene is on in the one that was inherited in the sperm, but off in the one that is inherited in the egg, right? So, so this means this is the allele that I inherited from my father, so I inherited it through the sperm, uh, and it is not methylated, so it is transcribing. And then here's the other allele that I inherited um, through the egg from my mother, and it is methylated, and therefore is not transcribing. So we can see it in either direction. So this is for um, for growth factor 2. But actually, this is the growth factor 2 receptor. Um, and we see the, the exact opposite pattern. So here we see uh, that the egg-inherited allele is not methylated and therefore is transcribing, is expressing, whereas the sperm-inherited allele is methylated and therefore not transcribing. So this is the phenomenon of genomic imprinting, where one allele is methylated and silenced, and the other allele is not methylated and is expressed. And so this is strange. This is new for us, right? Because when we talked about lactase, uh, both in bacteria and in humans, um, we said that it didn't matter. It, you, it didn't matter which allele came from where. We just analyzed the problem in terms of the, the number of two alleles. That's also the case for HERC2. It's the case for ACA2. Um, and it's generally the case uh, behind dominance and recessivity, right? With dominance and recessivity, we don't ask, 
which parent was an allele inherited from. We just ask about which two alleles are present. So this is new and weird, and I think pretty cool. Um, and the other thing about it is, isn't this a strange way to do things? Because if we have the two alleles, why not just express both of the alleles? So, actually, we kind of know something about um, what's going on here. Sorry about that extra slide. Um, and what it seems to, we'll get back to this in a moment, but it seems to have to do with the paternal and maternal genomes being kind of in competition for fetal growth. Let's, let's go through the mechanics of it first. Okay, so what that would mean is let's, just, let's imagine that there is um, an allele in the population that causes a particular trait, and we'll just call that A star. And so A star is going to cause the gray trait. And so then if I tell you that this individual has the genotype A star A, so one normal allele and one um, affecting allele, um, what is this individual's genotype? So how do we ask that? Do we ask which one, which one is dominant? No, we're not going to do that. We're not going to ask what's the sex of the offspring like we did in sex limitation. Instead, what we're going to ask is how was the A star inherited? Did it come through the egg or the sperm? Because if all we know is that the diploid genotype here is A star A, there are actually two possible ways that that was inherited. Um, so let's start with, so in, or, in order to uh, analyze this, we first have to decide whether what gene we're talking about here. Um, so let's start by talking about um, this gene IF2, uh, sorry, IGF2, uh, which is expressed from the paternal allele, from the sperm-inherited allele. Okay, so if that's the case, um, then one possibility is that the A star allele came down through the, the egg, and the A allele came down through the sperm. Okay, so this is paternally expressed. Um, so what that means is that the allele that came through the egg is methylated, and therefore it's not expressed. So in this case, we would only be expressing the A allele, and the individual would not be affected with the A star trait. Okay, the other possibility is that the A star was inherited from the father. So in that case, we still have the diploid A star A genotype. But in this case, the A allele is methylated, and the A star is expressing. So the A the allele, though it's there, is not expressing, it's not transcribing. And so the A star allele is the one that will express, and will have uh, an individual that's affected with the phenotype. So what about the father? Okay, so, so is the father affected in this case or not? Well, we know, again, we know the father's genotype. It's A star, and then we don't actually know the other one. Um, but let's just imagine it's A star A. But this father could have one of two situations. If the father inherited the A star allele through the egg, then we would expect that that allele is methylated in which case the father would express only the A and not be affected. But it could also be the other way around. It could be that the father inherited the A star allele from his father um, and the A allele from the mother, in which case the A star allele would be the only one that's expressed and we'd expect the father to be affected. This stuff is complicated and it's, it's, it takes some t getting used to. It's challenging and it, it, it's confusing and it really rewards um, working through problems and thinking about how this all fits together. Um, well, what about the other case? What about when the offspring inherited the A star from the mother? Well, then is the, is the mother affected? Well, actually, we could go through the exact same reasoning, right? It depends... We know that this, the mother has an A star allele here, but unless we know whether the A star came from her mother or from her father, we can't predict whether or not she will express the trait. 
Okay, so what's going on here? It seems to have something to do with growth. So genes like growth factors um, that seem to be involved in promoting fetal growth uh, seem to be on in the sperm-inherited paternal allele and off in the maternal one. And then genes that are the other way around, so this gene uh, IGF2 receptor actually antagonizes this gene. And genes like that that, uh, that, that block growth or that reduce growth, they tend to be expressed from the egg-inherited maternal gene and not expressed from the paternal. So the, the whole thing kind of looks like this. Um, growth is favored by uh, the GFR2, uh, which is paternally expressed. And that the action of that gene is antagonized, is blocked uh, by this other gene with almost the, an identical name um, that is maternally expressed. And so what seems to be going on here, and it's unfortunately beyond... Uh, uh, what I have time to get into in this class, um, is that there's competition between the maternally inherited and paternally inherited genomes. And so if you're interested, you can look in this very classic paper that describes it, uh, Genomic Imprinting in Mammalian Development, a Parental Tug of War by Moore and Haig. Okay, so we've introduced methylation in the context of imprinting, but in fact, methylation is a very general mechanism of regulation. Um, it's involved in regulating things at the stage-specific level, the tissue-specific level, condition-specific level, and, and the sort of negative autoregulation. All of these sorts of things um, can make use of this very general regulatory mechanism of methylation. So this is the phenomenon of epigenetics. Um, which epi, it's genetics with epi, epi means on top of. And so it's kind of like in, in addition to the identity of cytosine as a cytosine base, this is something, this is information on top of that. That little methyl group gives additional information on top of the genetic sequence. And nobody seemed to like this joke in class, but I'm going to stick with it. One way to remember this would be like, G's on top of genetics, I need to know epigenetics on top of genetics, too. All right. At least when you don't laugh at home when you're watching this, I don't have to hear the silence in the room. <laughs> so one way to think about this would be kind of negative regulation for the lazy regulatory protein. Okay, so we're accustomed to thinking about regulation as a protein comes in and binds near a gene and its binding influences that gene. It could be ne negatively or positively regulate it, but in this case, it negatively regulates it. So the binding of this gene, of this protein, the continued binding of this protein regulates the gene nearby. Well, what about in the case of methylation? Well, here we also have a regulator. We have a, a DNA methyltransferase, which comes and interacts with a site near this gene. But in this case, what it does is it leaves this stable mark, this methyl group, on the CGs such that the gene is silenced, but that the gene will stay silenced, right? Uh, DNMT does not need to stay associated with the site. It's already left a mark that will keep this gene silenced. So this is why I'm thinking you can kind of think about it as negative regulation, uh, a negative regulatory mechanism for a lazy regulator. Okay, so uh, that's all I have to say about imprinting and methylation for now. Um, hope that was useful.